everyone. It is another Tuesday, so I'm really excited to be able to share again today. Um, it's been an amazing week. Uh, I've been watching a lot of the rainstorms, which have just been absolutely incredible. Uh, so again, Sansei again. Uh, welcome. Hello. Um, again, my name is Chantal. I am Cree, Anishinaabe, and Métis from Muscat Lake Cree Nation in Saskatchewan, which is in Treaty 6 territory. But um, first, we always like to start by acknowledging the land upon which we stand, because if you don't know where you are, then you don't know where you're going. So this is the home uh, of the Treaty 7 people. I live here in Calgary, which is known as Mohinstis. Um, it is where the two rivers come together. So the Bow River and the Elbow River come together. And um, it's a place of bringing people together to learn about each other, to share in community, um, to share in ceremony, to share in all these wonderful things. And this is a history, it's a legacy that's been going on here for thousands upon thousands of generations. And so it's really important to acknowledge that history, to acknowledge that um, connection that we have to the land. So I acknowledge the Blackfoot of Siksika, Gainai, and Bagani. I acknowledge the Sursa Bene from Tsutsuna and the Stony Nakoda from Morley, which includes Chiniki, Bears Paw, and Westley First Nations. Uh, I actually just uh, was out there uh, yesterday. We were hiking um, not far from there, and it was just absolutely beautiful. Uh, and it really gives you a sense of place when you're really on the land, connected to the land. You're hiking, you're walking past the river, and just hearing the sound of the uh, river rushing is just absolutely beautiful. And it made me really appreciate, you know, those. Those things that Creator has made and that have been here for time in memoriam, I was watching the cliff face and how you know the river has just eaten away at it, and to think of the generations before us that were witnessing that, and what we see here. Hi Rose. <laughs> so um, it was just a blessing to be able to uh, be in that moment and be in that space and think of the people that were there before me, and so um, just to honor. All of those people um, honor all of those families that have been here for thousands upon thousands of generations. Also, uh, to honor the Métis Region 3, uh, which I wear my Métis sash proudly. And surprisingly enough, this Métis sash uh, I actually received from a Blackfoot elder from Siksika. So uh, I was very, very thankful <laughs> when he was like, yeah, I think you, sh you should wear this because I don't think I'll be wearing it much. And so I was really, really humbled and thankful for that. Um, but I think it's really important to just understand our sense of place. Um, I've been thinking about that a lot lately as I've been kind of digging around in the garden and hiking with the kids. There is uh, a deep connection that we have and that we need to maintain with Mother Earth because that's where we get our guidance from, whether it be the earth itself, whether it be the plants and watching how their struggles turn into something beautiful, watching them break through the soil. There's something really magical about that. Uh, we've been watching that um, with just the greatest amount of attention and <laughs> sitting there every day and checking on um, my garden to see if it's starting to sprout, if it's starting to grow. I feel like, you know, a mom always peeking in at her baby just to make sure he's still breathing. Because uh, I know that I did that with my first son. I was like, mm, is he okay? Um, but it feels the same way when, you know, you plant a garden and you're laying those seeds, for you're laying that foundation. And um, I'm hoping that the garden will actually sustain us um, because we have quite a few beds and I'm really, really looking forward to harvesting it uh, in a good way. We did the three sisters planting style, so I've been thinking a lot about companion plants and how certain plants grow really, really well together and they nurture the soil together, but they come together to support each other and to lean on each other. And I think we as people, we need to take that role as well. We need to learn from those companion plants and how they support each other and support each other more in a community aspect and a more of a relationship, um, which is totally why we do the land acknowledgement, to acknowledge that relationship. And so um, to welcome everybody into the circle today, I'd like to share the Cree welcome song. And um, usually when we sing songs, we sing in rounds of four to honor the four directions of the medicine wheel. But this song is a little bit different. We actually sing it in rounds of three to keep the circle open and welcoming so uh, everybody completes the circle today. Oh, hi, Doreen. Um, and in the circle, we're all connected. There's no beginning. There's no end. No one is greater or less than anyone else in the circle, just like in the hoop of life. So it teaches us to honor and respect each other uh, for those differences. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you know there's no greater or less than anything, just like those companion plants. Nobody's greater or less than, we support each other, and so we have to support each other in that circle. And um, so when I share this song, I honor the Nakaha family from Sturgeon Lake Cree Nation um, for 
sharing this song uh, for many generations, for holding it sacred for many, many generations so that we could share it um, with the world. So I'm very, very humbled and thankful every time I sing this song. There's a certain power to it, and it really reminds us of where we've come from and how important it is to come together and build community in a meaningful way. And so Mia Sin, which is the Cree welcome song, it uh, doesn't just mean welcome, it also means beautiful, and I'm going to stand up to sing. circle today everybody so uh, we're gonna of course start with this smudge I think it's really important to be able to do that just so that we can stay grounded and um, it's a way to kind of get at, rid of anything that we're carrying I'm gonna actually talk a little bit about the medicines today because I know um, we've been smudging a lot with uh, with every Tuesday when I share the smudging but I haven't really talked in depth about the medicines and I was kind of thinking about that um, so I have been doing the smudging and touching base uh, a little bit on what each medicine means and why it's in each direction, but I think I wanted to go a little bit more in depth with that today. Because there are stories behind each of the medicines and how we use them. Um, and so, that being said, um, I'm going to start in the east, um, because in that's where the sun rises every morning. So we have Grandfather Sun in the east, and um, when we look at the medicine wheel, it's really, it's about balance. So we have Grandfather Sun in the east, Grandmother Moon in the west, so it's that masculine energy and that feminine energy, because we're a balance of both. Uh, we're all that balance of both. So whether we be, you know, in a feminine body or masculine body, or have those energies, uh, we are a balance of both. And I think it's really important that we honor all of those energies within us. Um, and so we're gonna start in the East with Grandfather Sun. So Grandfather Sun, he greets us every morning um, and he reminds us that every day is a new day, every day is a new opportunity. Uh, when we look at the medicine wheel and we break it down, we not only break it down like masculine and feminine, we have our spirit as well as uh, our grounding, so our physical body. So it's really about acknowledging everything around us. Um, in the east, we have our mind where it balances our heart in the west. And so the medicine that we have there is sweetgrass. Even though I don't smudge with all of the medicines each time I smudge, I always lay them out to respect and honor um, their stories and their energy and that balance that they bring. So, oh, sweetgrass always smells really, really good. <laughs> and um, I've had to uh, chase my cats off my smudge stuff because they like to chew on it. So, <laughs> so I planted some cat grass. It has definitely avoided the whole chewing of the sweetgrass. For the most part, there's still some, some things that are happening. But um, 
sweetgrass is really, really amazing. It's uh, great for the mind. Um, if we look at it, it actually teaches us how to make good decisions. So it reminds us that um, we are a mixture of several things. So we have our mind, we have our heart, we have our physical body, but then this, uh, the center of it, the core of it is our spirit. So all four directions are in the sweet grass, but it's considered the men's medicine or the sweetest medicine or the children's medicine. Um, and because of that, uh, sometimes you'll hear uh, women on the moon time won't smudge with sweet grass because they're on the moon time. And it's because the masculine energy um, or the, the female energy at that time is really, really strong within us. And so we don't want to overwhelm that medicine. And so this is why women won't often go to mixed ceremonies because we're already going through our own personal ceremony. So why double up? And so the people who are there, um, they need that energy more. And spirits tend to come to women who are on their moon time uh, and talk to us a lot because we're so open at that time because we, we are going through that ceremony. <clears throat> oh, great. Hold on a second. Thank you for letting me know. I'm going to adjust my sound here. Sounds. Okay. All right. Let me see what's going on here. Levels. Oh, it's because it was super, super quiet. Oops. Okay. Is that better? All right. I think I think I've dealt with the uh, the issue with the sound. Hopefully, <laughs> awesome. Thank you so much for letting me know, Rose. That's perfect. Awesome. Can you hear me now? We're good. Fantastic. Awesome. Oh, and thank you. <laughs> so uh, back to the sweet grass. Um, the reason it's braided is because it reminds us that we're carrying our ancestors with us. So whenever we're making a decision, we have to think seven generations behind. What did my ancestors do to bring me to this moment? Am I honoring all of the sacrifices that they went through, all of the hardships that they had to endure, that foundation that they laid for me, and um, everything that they've done to bring me to this moment? And then we think seven generations forward. What am I doing to leave a lasting legacy for my future generations? Um, and so when we make decisions like that, we make way better decisions. And Sweetgrass helps us with those decisions. Whenever we, I'm trying to make um, a decision or even sometimes I get a lot of anxiety when it comes to uh, my email. So I'll smudge with Sweetgrass before I check my email. Um, but when we look at a, a braid of Sweetgrass, each section actually has seven blades of Sweetgrass in it to remind us of those seven generations and they're all woven together so it also reminds us that we're somebody's ancestor so we have to walk in a good way um, and so this is why it's so so important uh, sweetgrass is just really incredible for the mind it's incredible for focus um, i have my my boys have um, asd so they're on the spectrum so uh sometimes when they're having <laughs> like days where they're really, really overwhelmed or they can't calm their mind, we'll smudge with sweetgrass and they'll be able to just balance it and they'll have way better days at school. Um, and they'll be able to focus and get things accomplished, which is really, really wonderful. And so uh, it's really good for anxiety. It's really good for just calming the mind. Uh, and you can even put in tea. So sometimes if I'm having a lot of um, insomnia, I will put sweetgrass in my tea and it actually helps. It's way better than chamomile, I find, for insomnia. So yeah. This is sweetgrass, and that's the men's medicine. It's in the east. Um, the element that we have there is fire. Um, I think of it like that spark of creativity, or you know, that burning desire to learn. Uh, every time we learn something, there's like a little synapsis that fires in our brain. So that's where that that spark, that fire, that sense of fire goes. Also, grandfather's a big ball of fire, so that's a good way to remember it too. So. This is sweetgrass, and that's in the East. Um, and again, these are just my teachings. I think it's really, really important that um, you uh, are able to like talk um, to different elders, to different knowledge keepers from many, many different nations to find what works for you, what makes sense for you, and what you're going to be able to implement in your own life to be able to live in a good way. Um, and so it's not right or wrong, it's just different. It's about really discovering who you are in that connection that you have to uh, those teachings. Mm -hmm. um, so that being said, we're going to follow the sun, we're going to go to the south, and in the south, we have cedar. So cedar is amazing. I use a lot of cedar. Um, cedar is uh, it's the body medicine. It's really good for our bodies. So uh, in the east, we have our childhood. In the south, 
we have our adolescence. So that's our transition between childhood to adulthood. Because if we were kids one day and then the next day we would uh, woke up and we were adults, we'd be like, oh my God, it would freak us out. It would be really weird. And it would freak our parents out and they would start throwing things going, who are you? Get out of my house. If anybody's seen the movie Big, that would be like it was. But no. <laughs> so uh, we need that transition time though. And so Cedar is really about understanding and finding our paths. When we look at Cedar, it has many different offshoots, many, many different paths that it follows that it can take, but it takes the path of least resistance and this is why it can grow. Um, it reminds us of our deep connection that we have to grandmother, uh, to the earth, um, because the trees are our oldest living relatives. They have been around for thousands of years and breathing with us. They remind us of that relationship that we have with the earth, because when they breathe out, we breathe in and vice versa. We have this uh, relationship where we actually take care of each other and all of the plants do that in some way. Um, all of the animals do that. They're here, they're our teachers. And so the South reminds us of that connection to our body. It reminds us that we're spiritual beings, but we're on a physical journey. So we have to honor our body. We have to honor the earth because we're part of it, just like she's part of us. Um, and so cedar helps us to do that. Cedar is amazing as well. I use it for way too much stuff. So um, if uh, it's really good for eczema, you grind it up uh, and add like coconut oil. I use bear grease, but you can use coconut oil because not a lot of people have access to bear grease. Um, and just put it on the eczema and it actually dries it out, heals it up, it's amazing. Uh, I put it in tea when um, I have, like if I feel like a cough or a cold coming on, so I have a little bit of cedar in my tea right now um, because I've, I've been really wheezy. It's allergy season. As soon as I start smelling those lilacs, as lovely as they are, I start wheezing along with them. But cedar helps a lot. It's actually, um, it's antibacterial, antifungal, antiviral, and it's an antihistamine. So this is why it's phenomenal. I use way too much cedar. Um, so you have to use it in moderation or else it's not going to work like you need it to. Um, so I only use it when I absolutely need to. Um, and it's really good also for asthma. You can boil it on the stove and breathe it in. I'm going to definitely do that after this. Uh, but it helps just clear up your throat, uh, your um, chest, anything that's bugging you. It's really, really great. So um, I swear by it. It's really good for grounding energy. Oftentimes if you're in a ceremony where you're letting things go, you'll put the cedar in the fire because that is what holds down that energy and brings it back into the earth. Um, and so it's really about grounding, respecting our body, respecting the earth. Um, and respecting that transition time from childhood to adulthood um, because that's that's when we actually are discovering our path and so it's okay to be selfish um, so in Cree uh, when you're 12 you actually are considered your path of, of growing up of transitioning to adulthood so in Cree it starts at about the age of 12 and it ends between the ages of about 22 to 24 um, and Surprisingly enough, I love it when science proves things we've done for thousands of years because it makes me look super smart. Awesome. But our bodies and our brains actually stop developing between the ages of 12 to 24. We go through the most physical changes outside of our mothers between the ages of 12 to 24. And so it's amazing how all of our teachings get proven by science many, many times again and again and again. And so, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it, it reminds us about really finding our own path. And it's really difficult, I think, for um, kids who are coming of age. You know, they're starting, we don't have those uh, coming of age ceremonies like we used to, where we would, um, you know, honor the kids uh, for transitioning into adolescence, um, into really discovering who they are and their path, what their path's going to be. Um, because at this age, they get bombarded with so many things like you should be this, or you should do this, or you're really good at this, so do this, or um, you have to follow in your parents' footsteps, or this is what your friends are telling you to do. And so it's important to just dial it back and ask that youth, what do you want to do? What is your passion? How are you going to make a difference in the world? And when we do that, when we give them the opportunity to do it for themselves, that's when we see incredible things happen. It's really about honoring and having faith in what those youth have to offer the world. Um, not about telling them what they should do, but just ushering them um, on finding the path that is meant for them. Uh, and so this is what Cedar teaches us. It teaches us just to sit back and let those youth bloom. You let those flowers bloom. You can't sit there and open up a flower. You have to just let it happen. Um, same with you know, all of the <laughs> animals and uh, insects and everything. They teach us that. They teach us to just lay back, sit down and watch the magic happen. And that's what the youth 
are going to show us. This is why it's so important to be able to um, hear from the youth and hear their perspectives and uh, just nurture them in any way you can, but not force them. And so it's really about not forcing. Uh, so that's a great thing, and that's uh, cedar. Um, then we move to the west, and in the west we have sage. Sage is amazing. Uh, it actually grows on every single continent. So I have buffalo sage here. Um, I have like eight different kinds of sage, but I'm not going to bust them all out right now because they all smell really, really different. Um, so some of them grow in more dry climates. So we have white sage that grows on the desert, uh, and sage is connected to the water. So when we look at sage, the one thing that's really, really amazing about sage is I'm actually going to pull out my white sage for this one. Ooh. So um, I lived in Arizona for uh, probably about four and a half, almost five years because I made some bad decisions in my 20s. But uh, when I was down there, I learned a lot uh, and it was really, really amazing. So I would go out on the land and I would pick white sage. And there was one day um, in Arizona, it's really hot. You're in the middle of the desert. So we're sitting there and we're picking sage in the middle of the desert and I was just sweltering. It was like 45 degrees, super, super hot, no shade anywhere. I'd finished probably six bottles of water and I, I was just done. And I looked at my elder and I'm like, I'm sorry, I just can't handle it anymore. I'm, I'm really thirsty and I, I have to leave. I have no more water left. And he's like, but there's water all around you. And I was looking at him, I'm looking around, I'm like, we're in the middle of the desert, buddy. <laughs> and he's like, no, but if you know where to find it, creator provides. And so go to your sage and that's so I go, went to my sage and he was like no snap off a stem and so I snapped off a stem and he said look at it and I looked and inside I'm not sure if you can see that it's kind of hollow it is totally hollow so it looks like a straw and he said now ask permission and dig under the sage so I did that and don't disturb the roots and so as I'm digging under I found that the roots were protecting this little pocket of water and so he said, just use it like a straw. And so I flipped it around and I used it like a straw and it actually filtered the water. So it wasn't like drinking cement, but it filtered out all the sand and all the dirt, everything. It was amazing. And any of the sediment, um, and it was really refreshing. It was cold because it was under the ground, under the, under the sand. Um, and he said, but in the dry season, you're not gonna find that pocket of water under the sage. And so, yeah, you're gonna have to ask permission from another beautiful plant that lives in the middle of the desert, which is the cactus. And the cactus have cactus water, they have milk inside, but you don't wanna crack it open because if you do that, then it'll die. It won't be able to you know, replenish itself and grow back. But if you go to this and just pull a little, one of the spines out, just twist it and pull it out, you'll get a tiny hole. And all you'll do is you'll pop in your sage stem, kind of like a juice box and you'll drink it. And it kind of tastes like Gatorade. It's actually really good, <laughs> uh, but it was amazing. I felt really rejuvenated and refreshed after that. And I was able to finish picking, even though it was scorching, scorching hot. And so uh, it reminded me why sage was connected so deeply with water. It's because it helps us to find it. It protected the water in the desert, but it also helped us to consume the water in a respectful and an appropriate way that balanced those plants. Um, and so it's considered the women's medicine um, because we're connected to water. We have Grandmother Moon who moves the tides. So she'll shift the tides, she'll, um, she basically controls the tides. This is, and our bodies are mostly water. This is why we go a little crazy around a full moon. But uh, it teaches us to really honor and respect that cycle that we have with water. Because women have that cycle every 28 days. So just like Grandmother Moon. So if you ever have a doubt as a woman that you're sacred, you just look up in the moon and you're like, yeah, yeah, I'm sacred. That's my sacred ceremony that I get, I get every month to remind me that I'm sacred. And so um, it's really about honoring that transition and honoring our emotions because our emotions are liquid too. This is why we have waves of emotions um, and they are so powerful. Our emotions are so incredibly powerful and without them, we wouldn't be here. We need them to connect to our family, to connect with our friends, to connect with ourselves, to build community in a meaningful way. We have to have our emotions or else we wouldn't, we wouldn't be invested in anyone else. We wouldn't be invested in ourselves and we wouldn't have what we have now with our incredible families and friends um, and the communities that we work so hard to maintain because we care, because we actually love and care for everyone around us, uh, which is just such a beautiful gift. 
And so sage helps us with that. It helps us with our own personal healing. It reminds us that sometimes we have to replenish ourselves um, to be able to help other people. I think sometimes, especially as caregivers or teachers uh, or our parents, we tend to give and give and give and forget that we need to give to ourselves as well. And sage is that reminder. It's um, that moment to just take stock and to rejuvenate ourselves. This is why we smudge with sage almost all the time. It's really, really wonderful. Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit about this particular sage. So this is white sage or desert sage. I even have it labeled on the bag, white or desert sage. And it smells uh, really dusty. Um, I don't know, I, I find it smells dusty up here. But when I was down in the States, it smelled wonderful. It, it was, uh, I asked my elder, why? Why does it smell different when I burn it here versus down south? And uh, he said, because the medicines are meant for different things depending on where you are. So this is why we would trade our medicines and this is why we would trade sage. So sage is really good for, um, or white sage, good for a lot of people have been smudging their homes with it. Um, it is, it's really good for balancing and cleansing the air. Um, but I find it smells different, whereas if I smudge with buffalo sage here, it smells natural, it smells like home. Where I burnt buffalo sage down in Arizona, and it smelled really weird, but the white sage down there smelled beautiful, and it smelled like home. And so it's interesting where those medicines belong is where when you use them. And it's also important to really understand uh, the medicines deeply and have relationships with each and every medicine. Um, but sage, I'm being the wind medicine. Oops, I just dropped some. Ah, this is the one that wants to be used. That's probably why. A uh, little teaching about it is uh, it comes on the stem. And so um, this is kind of an OG Cree teaching is uh, when we gift it to someone, we always leave it on the stem. But when we pull it off, it holds our energy, it holds our intentions. And we don't want to dictate how somebody's going to pray, how somebody's going to use the medicine. So to honor and respect them um, and their wishes for that medicine and what they need that medicine to do for them, we'll leave it on the stem for them. Um, also, if they want to pass it on and give it uh, to, uh, to gift it to someone, you also want to make sure that it that holds that energy for them. And so I'm just bundling that up here. And um, this is the Cree Crunch. So the Cree Crunch is you just crunch it in your hand. And then this is the Blackfoot Roll, because this is the medicine that we're going to be burning today, the sage. Awesome. So uh, yeah, so the sage is the women's medicine. Uh, it's uh, also when we become adults. So when we become adults, we become, um, you well, hopefully learn unconditional love, being able to understand sacrifice, to be able to give to our community, give of ourselves. That's when we become uh, parents or aunts and uncles or mentors or teachers or leaders within our communities. And this is why that sage is so instrumental in helping us move into that phase of life uh, and really um, care deeply for everyone around us, but also to remember to, you know, fill up our own cup. So the last medicine that we have, I have this cute little container in the cute little package. Uh, I have a lot of tobacco. <laughs> so um, this is tobacco and tobacco is a sacred medicine. So um, for the longest time, I know a lot of people um, have some issues around tobacco because people will smoke it. Um, and <laughs> my mom told me this wonderful story. So when she started on the red road, um, her elder uh, told her that she would share with her, but she needed to bring her tobacco. And my mom was like, well, what do you smoke? And her elder's like, I don't smoke. And my mom's like, well, you want tobacco, but you don't smoke. And the elder's like, that's right. <laughs> and my mom's like, I don't understand. She's like, well, tobacco is a sacred medicine. And so we're not actually supposed to take it into our bodies. It's not meant for us. This is why it makes us sick. And this is why it has a bad reputation for, you know, people getting addicted to it. But it's not that they're actually addicted to the plant itself. Um, it's that they have... Um, some hurt they have hurt they have pain they have trauma in their heart and so because uh, the tobacco is like the it's creator's medicine my mom calls it creator's cell phone but it's our way to pray and sometimes um, that praying will get a little um it'll it'll shift and so it's almost like a crutch and so it's understanding what the relationship we need to have with that medicine is so that we can let it go and that comes with any substance as well it's understanding where is that trauma where's that hurt where's that pain coming from it's not actually that substance that you're addicted to it's what you're trying to avoid um and 
I learned this because I smoked for many, many, many years. And I would quit and start and quit and start. And I couldn't, I felt like I couldn't ever stop because it was for so long that I was smoking. And then um, finally one day I was in ceremony and I was thinking about the relationship that I had with tobacco. And, and I had to like dial it back and go like, okay, well, what am I carrying? Why am I using tobacco and what am I avoiding? And so not only was I um, having to heal my own trauma, my own pain and my own wounds, but I had to, I was carrying my Cookham's uh, pro um, issues, my grandmother, because she was raised in a residential school, but I was also carrying my mom's trauma and pain um, because of that intergenerational trauma. And I knew that I wanted to break that cycle of abuse and I had broken that for my own children, but I was still getting myself into really negative relationships. Um, and I had a neg neg negative relationship with tobacco. And so as soon as I kind of had that realization and I had to, you know, honor them and forgive them and pray for their healing as well. And then I was able to let tobacco go. And so of course, as soon as I quit smoking officially, everybody started gifting me tobacco. So I have a lot of tobacco, <laughs> but um, it's it's humbling every time you, I, you're gifted tobacco because it's saying thank you from someone's spirit to your spirit. We gift it to an elder to thank them for saying a prayer because it helps them to tap into something higher than us. Uh, we gift it to drummers or singers or storytellers to thank them for keeping those songs and those stories alive and those traditions alive. Um, and it's such a beautiful gift to be able to do that. When we're um, thinking of someone and we want to pray for them in a deeper way, we'll sprinkle tobacco uh, on the ground and pray for them. And that's our way of giving to Mother Earth so that she can do the work that needs to happen for that person. Um, I also put it in my garden, which is really, really amazing. I'm really excited for this year. So a few years ago, um, when we did put it in our garden, we had mutant vegetables like <laughs> it made the vegetables huge so uh our mini cucumbers ended up being like footballs and uh our dill was like six and a half feet tall it was like this forest of dill it was insane the catnip didn't last but the dill was insane um and so we're mixing a lot of the tobacco into the soil and we're thanking those plants for the gifts that they are going to give us we're thanking the earth for holding these plants sacred and um it's just our way to give back because if we take and take and take and take, there's gonna be nothing left. So we always have to give something back. So this is why we always give back tobacco. Whenever I pick sage, I always give tobacco back to the land or sweetgrass, always giving tobacco back to the land. And it reminds us about that sacred sense of ceremony that we have to have. We have to have that sense of ceremony, that sense of uh, give and take and appreciation for all of those animals and those plants that we're using. Uh, even when uh, you go hunting, you say a prayer for those animals and you ask which animal is going to gift itself to you. Um, and it's more humbling and you really appreciate that animal in a meaningful way and you make sure that no, no part of it gets wasted because you have that relationship with it. And so it's really important. And tobacco teaches us. It teaches us about that spiritual relationship that we have. So um, that being said, I'm going to smudge. So um, here we have our smudge bowl. So the bowl itself, this is um, uh, abalone, and it uh, represents water. So this is why it holds everything. It represents the, the woman. And so whatever we put into the bowl, so today it's sage, as soon as it goes into the bowl, it's considered earth. So it's that connection to the earth. Um, when we light it on fire, of course, it's fire, which is our connection to um, the uh, east, grandfather, son and our mind, and then if the smoke uh, going to creator, that is considered air, that's our prayers, that's spirit. And so all four directions are represented in the smudge bowl. And so when we light it, which I'm going to do now, there's no right or wrong way to smudge. It's whatever feels good to you. And so if it's a short smudge, uh, it's just about setting intention. So oftentimes it's, it's the way we pray. And all prayer is is intention, it's making wishes. And so you'll notice I'm fanning it with my hand. Um, I never uh, blow on it because our breath is our life and our life is precious and we don't waste that for anybody. So we want to be able to honor our own lives. Sometimes you can fan it with your uh, a feather as well, but like I said, I have cats. My feathers never ever last. The first thing I do is I um, wash my hands in it. 
So if you're wearing jewelry, um, sometimes uh, the metal will hold energy, so you might want to take that off. Um, but if it's something like a wedding ring, um, you can that's part of you, right? Uh, if it's piercing that you don't take out ever, that's a part of you as well. Um, so it's really just about acknowledging what feels good. All right, so I wash my hands, so anything that I'm carrying, I get rid of. I bring it over my body four times, down to the four directions in my body. Just nudge my mind so I can think clearly and learn from everyone who crosses my path. And also to, I can be open and not judge. Smudge my ears so I can be open to hear all of the messages that Creator sends me. Also to remind myself that we have two ears and one mouth so we can listen twice as much as we speak. Smudge my eyes so I can see all of the beauty and Creator has made and also so I can be open to see things that maybe we might need it. I'm going to smudge my nose so I can smell danger in cookies. Right now I'm smelling my roast. It's starting to smell real good. <laughs> smudge my mouth so I can speak true and kind words that are helpful and a benefit to mankind. I always get my kids to ask themselves, is it truthful? Is it helpful? Is it kind? Is it respectful? If it's one of those things, don't say it, don't do it. Smudge my throat. So I'm very thankful for my voice this lifetime, so I can continue to give voice to the voiceless. I smudge my heart, so I can remember to be kind and compassionate and show unconditional love to all of those around me, my friends and family, and to strangers. Smudge my stomach, so all the food that I eat this day will nourish my body. Smudge my womanhood, because I'm very thankful to be a woman and a mother in this time. I smudge my shoulders and my back so I can carry all of the responsibilities that Creator has gifted me with grace and humility. I smudge my arms and my hands so I can do the good work that Creator's put me here to do. Very thankful for my hands as an artist as well. I give thanks for the blessings that I do have. I smudge my legs. I can walk this red road in a good way. I smudge my feet so I stay grounded and connected to Mother Earth and tread lightly upon her, honoring her with every step. Uh, and then if there's anywhere that you need a little extra love, so uh, I've been doing a lot of gardening, so my back's a little sore, <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, but I'm very, very excited. Um, I've been planting some trees as well, so I'm very excited to have a cedar tree and a willow tree at this home. And uh, my hips, of course, are always sore. But if there's anybody uh, that you want to send prayers to, uh, love and appreciation to, maybe they're just in your thoughts. Uh, you hold them in your heart, and you just send that love to them. Whether they need emotional healing, spiritual healing, physical healing, mental healing, uh, or just that sense of connection, you just send that love and appreciation to them. And then when you're done, you just say hi hi or miigwetch or merci or uh, grazia or xie xie, however you say thank you in your language. It's really important to honor the language that um, that you speak or that uh, your ancestors did. All right, so I'm going to have a sip. And then I'm going to share the creator song it's because that song has really been on my mind a lot, especially when you're like, so deeply connected to the earth and you're planting things and you're um, praying for those different plants, it, uh, it puts it into perspective that, that um, you know, creator is all around us. <laughs> Creation is all around us. And so it's really beautiful to see how much life is just teeming in the earth and all around us um, and how we're part of that. We're a reflection of that uh, as well as we need to reflect upon it. So yeah, this is a creator song. I'm going to stand up this one. And this song um, was gifted or shared with me from um, my friend Elizabeth. And now uh, we have her cat. So I have a song and a cat from her. <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but she had learned it um, from a Cree elder. And I was so thankful that she had passed it forward. Uh, and I hope to learn more. So this is the creator song.
family of bees living under our step right now. It's pretty amazing. But they're endangered bees, so I feel like I'm supporting an ecosystem. <laughs> also, pollinators, so my garden's gonna do really well this year. Mm. So um, the next song I wanted to share with you, um, I was thinking a lot about a couple friends of mine, uh, one from Siksika and one who was down in Gainai, who shared this song with me. And it's cool because they shared different ways of singing it, but it's just such a beautiful song. It's the only Blackfoot song I know. <laughs> this is called, uh, it's called the I Love You song, Gitsi Gakomen. And I think originally it was done by Olivia Tailfeathers, <clears throat> and um, she had shared it uh, along with a bunch of other uh, songs for schools because I think it's so important for children to learn. Um, to understand the history of this land, understand how they connect to the land, understand their place in the land as well. And so when they become youth, they're better equipped to really set that foundation for our future generations. <clears throat> and so this is Gitsi Kokomen. Usually I do it as a call and response when I'm with kids because it gives them the opportunity to really uh, learn how to sing. <clears throat> And we're gonna sing it straight through. <laughs> that we can share in a meaningful way <clears throat> but you don't feel so alone you feel like you've got lots of people hanging out chilling in, in the house which is starting to smell really good right now but <clears throat> um, I'm gonna share uh, another song um, and just the story behind it <clears throat> so this is the Raven song if I can get the bug out of my throat so uh, the Raven teaches us about humility uh, because the raven had to discover humility <laughs> in a big way um, and so uh, at the beginning of time um, when the animals looked very different than they do now because they had to learn what to share with us so they had to learn many many lessons so that they would be able to share with us the two leggeds because we need all the help we can get and so um, all of the animals were learning and uh, figuring out themselves figuring out what it was that made them special that they could share <coughs> and that they could teach us and so the raven uh he looked very different indeed he was covered he had beautiful rainbow feathers so no matter which way you looked at him he was iridescent too so he would like shine different colors and because of this he got a little full of himself so every time he would catch a glimpse in a puddle he'd be like oh, i am so gorgeous and fabulous and 
he used to just do this regularly, and so he started to think, well, maybe, because I'm so gorgeous and fabulous that I'm better than everybody else. And so, eventually, he started saying, you know, you shouldn't even try because I'm amazing, I'm gorgeous, I am fabulous, I can fly, and I'm so pretty, I am the best. And all the animals were like, Raven, like, you're not the best, there's no greater or less than, we're all equal. Like, just ask the bear, the bear knows that we're all equal. And Raven said, well, except for me, because, I mean, look at me, obviously I'm the best animal, so creator must love me the most. And all of the animals started listening to Raven after a while and thinking, well, if Raven's the best, then, well, I guess that means we're nothing. And so they stopped feeling special and they stopped doing what made them amazing. And so the beavers stopped cutting down trees and everything has just started getting really overgrown. And the birds stopped spreading the seeds and nothing started to grow in certain areas or certain things. <clears throat> the ants stopped cleaning up messes, bees stopped pollinating and everything started dying. And so everything just started getting out of hand. And the bear, who always keeps everything in balance and really appreciates everybody, and really gives that guidance for you know treating each other with respect, was like, whoa, 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 wait, what is happening here? Why is the whole world falling apart? What is going on? And the animals started telling, well, the bear, well, bear, the raven said that he's better than everybody else, so he's the best. Why should we even try? And the bear said, that's ridiculous. Nobody's greater or less than anyone else. So you know what? I'll go talk to the raven. I'll go deal with this crazy. And just keep doing what makes you amazing. Look at the world around us. It's falling apart because nobody's doing what makes them special. So just go ahead and be the best you that you can be. And so all of the animals went back to work doing exactly what make them who they are that what makes them special and really what makes the world around them thrive just by being them. <clears throat> and then the raven, uh, the bear lumbered over to the raven and said, Raven, what's your problem? You're making everybody feel bad. And the raven said, well, that's not my fault. I mean, look at me, they should feel bad because I'm obviously the best. And the bear said, Raven, you're not the best. There's no greater or less than, we're all equal. We're all in the same boat together. We all have different things that we're gonna give to the world and to the two leggings. And the raven said, except for me, because I am so fabulous and gorgeous and amazing that they're just gonna be in awe of how gorgeous I am. I'm obviously the best animal and creator loves me the most. And the bear said, that's ridiculous, raven. And they went back and forth for a while until finally the bear got frustrated and fed up and just like, okay, fine, raven, if you're the best, you have to prove it, go and catch the sun. And the raven, who wasn't really thinking, properly or straight was like Psh, yeah of course I'm the best animal of course I can catch the sun and so without thinking he started flying higher and higher and higher and he started getting warmer and warmer and warmer but he was determined to prove that he was the best so he flew higher and higher and higher until poof, his feathers burst into flames and he crashed into the ocean and as he swam to the shore, he looked down and his feathers were not rainbow anymore. They were completely burned, completely singed. And he was mad. Raven was so mad. He was so angry that the bear would play such a trick on him that he decided he was gonna give the bear a piece of his mind. And so he started angrily marching to the bear. Well, he was a raven, so he started angrily hopping to the bear. And as he was hopping, cause he had flown quite a ways, <clears throat> he started passing all of the other animals that he had made feel bad. And he watched as they did what made them amazing. He watched as the beaver cut down these trees and redirected the rivers. And he watched as the ants cleaned up all these messages and messes and he watched as the pollinators just went around and made all of these, everything grow. And he thought, wow, everybody's so amazing. But now I'm not special at all. And so he stopped feeling angry. And he started to feel bad <clears throat> and he apologized. He apologized to all of the animals for making them feel bad. He's like, guys, I'm so sorry. You're right. I wasn't the best. You guys are all amazing. You guys are all the best in your own way. I don't know why I would ever make you feel bad or less than anything. I'm really sorry, guys. And so he continued on his path apologizing to all of the animals on his way until he finally got back to the bear. And by the time he got back to the bear, he wasn't angry anymore because he'd walked it all off. But he was sad and he said, Bear, I'm sorry for making everybody feel bad. But now, Bear, I'm not special at all. And the bear said, no, Raven, you're really special indeed because you learned a really valuable lesson. 
you learned about humility. And that is exactly what you're going to be teaching to the two-leggeds. <clears throat> and the raven had to think about it for a minute. Humility. 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 And he thought about how he learned the lesson of humility. And he thought about that trick that the bear played on him. And the more he thought about it, the more he actually found it kind of funny. And then he started to laugh. And this is how the raven got his voice for the very first time. And he said, you're right, bear. And I know exactly how I'm going to teach all of the animals and all of the two-leggeds humility. I'm going to play tricks on them, just like you played that trick on me. But it's going to be the best every single time. And so this is how the raven became a trickster as well. And so still to this day, when we look at the raven, if you look at his feather, he still has a little shimmer of rainbow in his feather to remind him to stay humble. And so that's the raven story. <clears throat> so I'm going to attempt to sing. I don't know what ever got in my throat, but it's pretty rough. But this is the raven song. And um, this song I'd actually, um, I'd heard it once uh, online and I, it stuck and I was like, why do I know this song? Why do I know this song? And I kept trying to correspond back and forth with who had ever posted it um, until finally I got a hold of uh, somebody and they're like, yeah, no, this song has been in my family for a while. I'm like, I feel like I know it. And we were talking and it turns out, so he's Cherokee from the States, but we're related. We were actually third cousins. <laughs> so he, he was related to people from my reserve in Muskeg. And I was like, that's so weird. So it's interesting how sometimes those songs will cycle back to us or the stories and teachings will cycle back to us. And so um, I'm really thankful and humbled that this song has come back <clears throat> and uh, we call it a Cherokee song because <laughs> it's Cherokee and Cree, so Cherokee. And so this is the Raven song. Hey. 
So um, before I leave you today, I'm going to share the Cree Healing song. This is because I think it's really, really important. Um, somebody had asked me today if um, <clears throat> I would still be doing this thing every Tuesday, and I think it's really, it's really important. So I'm, I'm not in schools anymore, uh, like I love to be, um, and there's a lot of festivals and a lot of performances and a lot of um, different things where we're out in the community that there's, there's not that opportunity to do as of yet. So until things go back completely to normal, where I'm actually out in the community and we're able to drum together and sing together and hug each other and do wonderful things, um, in this is the next best thing. So I'm going to continue trying to do this every Tuesday. Uh, and um, yeah, it's just such a blessing to be able to share. Um, and I'm also in the process of writing some songs, so hopefully I'll be able to launch those and get people's opinions. And uh, yeah, I think it's just such a blessing to be able to share. And so I'm very, very thankful. Um, please do feel free. Anybody can listen to this. Anybody can watch this and hopefully um, get some inspiration or some healing um, and some peace. Um, and learn the songs, uh, especially the women's songs. So I'll, I'll do some more recordings of the women's songs because those are wonderful to be able to share at our different events where we march for murdered and missing indigenous women for their families, because that's truly what we march for, is we march for their families, for their healing, and for their journey towards justice. And so, um, yeah, this is the healing song, also called the crying song or the wailing song. And I learned it from several different elders, <clears throat> um, Marion Rot, uh, uh, Carrie Moore. Um, there was uh, so, so many elders, oh my gosh, that ha have carried this song. And so, um, when we hear it, it's almost like it's part of us. Everybody feels like they know it from somewhere. And so, <clears throat> in it, you can hear the tears, you can hear the crying, you can hear the wailing, but it teaches us to really honor those tears because that's where our healing truly comes from. Um, and it teaches us to really say, um, be thankful for what we have, but also pray for the healing of ourselves and others. <clears throat> and not just our physical healing. It reminds us that we need healing in all aspects of our lives to be able to be balanced and to be able to uh, live uh, well and healthy. And um, we need to honor our mind, we need to honor our heart, we need to honor our physical body, but we also need to honor our spirit. And so that's why this song uh, teaches us that. It's sung in four rounds to honor the four directions of the medicine wheel. But the third round, it's considered the healing round. So um, we stop drumming. And in that silence, I invite you to pray for the people that you want to pray for, um, for the intentions that you want to set for yourself. Um, don't forget to pray for yourself. I think it's really important. But for the world around us, for those things that we want to see and for the healing that we all need. And then when the drum beat comes back in, it's just letting all that intention out and letting Creator do the work that it needs to do with it. <clears throat> and so this is the healing song. to share the uh, Women's Warrior song. Um, I'm just thinking how many women have really been instrumental in guiding their family through um, all that has been happening 
but I know so many incredibly uh, powerful single moms that are holding it together or uh, people who are taking on all of these responsibilities and really taking care of their community and doing such amazing things. And though um, I think that's truly what a warrior is. It's someone who stands up for what's right, somebody who uh, is there for their community, is there for family, is there for friends, uh, is there in times of trouble and stands up for what's right and does what needs to get done. That's truly a warrior. And so it's to honor all of you warriors out there who are keeping it all together. And um, as we move forward into you know a new world, um, it's the warriors that are truly going to guide us on our path. So this is the Women's Warrior Song, which is They Wish, from the West Coast. <clears throat> Tuesday and hopefully I'll figure out this whole YouTube thing eventually I'm having some issues but we'll figure it out <laughs> we'll get you everyone have a beautiful week enjoy the weather and um, yeah take care of yourselves love you all good